remotely. Um, now everyone fasten your seatbelts because we're coming up to the, our lightning round speakers. Alessandra Zuba, Art, Science and Taxidermy is the title of her talk. Gar Waterman is speaking on Art, Science, Alchemy, turning sea slugs into superheroes. And Dr. Nicole Ackermans is speaking on the battering ram, traumatic brain injury and headbutting bovids. We will not have a formal, formal Q&A after this. Um, so enjoy it. Hello, everyone. Um, let me get the... Hi. <laughs> so grateful to be here with you all. My name is Alessandra Zuba, and I am an assemblage artist and taxidermist. Um, be talking to you about the intersection of science, art, and taxidermy. So I stumbled upon my career as a taxidermist by happenstance. It began simply wanting to document nature, exploring form and gender, death rituals, parallels with animals and humans, illustrating them um, uh, like as assemblages that I had created. Uh, but it wasn't until my plunge into taxidermy that I discovered that the assemblages themselves uh, were art. Uh, I started my journey at the University of Kansas where I spent most of my days at the Natural History Museum, drawing from their exhibits, particularly drawn to the dioramas, um, because hidden amongst them all um, were the infamous jackalopes. So when most people think about taxidermy and art, they actually think of the jackalope, which is an assemblage made by taxidermists as a humorous play on the antlered jackrabbit. When others think about the term taxidermy, they immediately think of Victorian galleries, um, hallways upon hallways of recreated atmospheres and stuffed animals. Um, but it, you know, not necessarily art included. Um, but if it wasn't for artists and taxidermists, uh, such as Martha Maxwell and um, the little slideshow kind of uh, hit her little. Um, uh, face in the corner, but <laughs> uh, she is a taxidermist that uh, pioneered the idea of um, dioramas and the art uh, behind it all. Um, but even she, like, who created a ton of museums of her time, um, always hid gaff taxidermy in her exhibits. So what is gaff taxidermy? These are art pieces that in the taxidermy world are whimsical mash of objects, um, either created the creating a mythical creature or an anthropomorphized animal, um, recreations of reality, which were like a very popular Victorian staple. Um, they, uh, they were very, they were kind of like a conversation starter. Uh, especially amongst avid collectors. Uh, they definitely engage the viewer, um, get people involved to participate in the specimens, specifically through humor, but still the original combination of art and taxidermy. Modern artists such as uh, Kate Clark, uh, Polly Morgan, and rogue taxidermist Sabrina, uh, Serena Brewer have paved the way for this new genre of work. Uh, moving taxidermy and these gaps into sophisticated art and not just whimsy. Uh, modern taxidermists like Alice Markham even merge fine art and set design to exaggerate form and elevating themselves as fine taxidermists. Um, this movement kind of started from classic assemblage artists such as Rauschenberg and other artists like him during the pop art era. But what's the difference of new work? Um, what, what are we you know, trying to create today? Um, so if you ask a modern taxidermist, they wouldn't call themselves uh, an artist or a scientist, um, but a craftsman, uh, extreme, but extreme amount of study and dedication to their work, uh, extensive study of anatomy, study of the skeletal structure and how it lays, uh, the muscular structure, move, movement and form all play a huge role in how to articulate your pieces. 
um, for example, my expertise is in skeletal articulation. So even though the skeletal structure seems to be the bare basics, um, you still have to study how it lays, how the muscles attach to the skeletal structure, how it moves, um, how the weight is distributed. So a bunch of study goes into each piece um, to articulate it correctly and also to make it look alive, um, bring life back into the piece. Um, my work started through creating gaps, um, but then I started to see the structure, structural um, similarities, assemblages um, of found objects, creating shape and mimicking memory, asking why did they remind me of something else. Then when I started diving into the world of taxidermy, I had the privilege of working even closer um, with those animals, especially from, you know, uh, working with the raw specimen, working with the bones, uh, creating these connections, observing the formations, like the bat wing, kind of very similar structure to how the human hand is, bone structures of similar other species. Um, and then if you kind of see through the raw form evolution there connecting us all together. So my works began small with these bird wings um, posed, to pin, posed to look like pin butterflies and quickly evolved as I continued moving closer into the realm of taxidermy out of the need of knowing where all my specimens were coming from. I combined my ma major in psychology with my BFA in printmaking and explored inkblots. Um, studying what it is to be the human animal, uh, you know, the psychological aspect um, beneath the bones. Um, and it was an important narrative uh, in my life, uh, which continued to help me understand not only myself, but my connection to nature. Um, but why inkblots? Uh, originally, inkblots were a tool used to um, evaluate sanity, but especially misused towards women, uh, using to diagnose hysteria, depression, anxiety, and often to label what is abnormal. Much can be said about psychology back then, um, but it started my interest into what is normal. Um, I felt personally collected, connected to that narrative what are common emotions, thoughts, feelings that, shared, that are shared trans species. Um, so I began using that same theory in my ink plots to test my subjects. Um, how does that work make you feel? Uh, what do you see within the images? But what also does it help bridge your understanding of the natural world? Of course, it's all kind of like a trick question um, <laughs> since there is no real answer um, and once you see that, once you understand that there isn't one, you kind of free yourself to, to see past the image um, and create connections within yourself subconsciously and without objectiveness. Um, from the natural objects that I use, I also incorporate dried flowers and other materials that allow me to sway the ink blot into my favor. Each piece starting with full investigation of form and structural commonalities reshaping and reconstruction. And, to, and once you develop those, you start seeing these recognizable paths. Um, overall, as an artist, I believe that we explore, we investigate, and we have the privilege to observe in many ways that others don't. Um, we are the artist scientist. There isn't much difference between the two. And I'd argue that our work shows successfully when we're able to speak to that um, common audience to create that connection with your audience. The art is there to allow you to explore yourself, explore the world around you and explore the details that can be easily overlooked. Even if this is a visceral reaction against the using animal products, it begins a conversation. Um, of course, I must say that conservation does play a huge role in my work, as it does for many of my peers. All specimens are 
collected not for the purpose of taxidermy, um, but with the idea that nothing goes to waste. Uh, so many naturalists and taxidermists kind of strive to break uh, the mold in unconventional ways to honor nature, changing the narrative and of allowing you to evaluate an object um, and to place it in a place it in a spot of tribute. So whether you're assembling things together or studying the nuance overall, both artists, scientists, and taxidermists recreate life in an unusual way, seeing things through a different lens and inspi hopefully inspiring others to honor and study nature as well. So thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Gar Waterman. Uh, I am a sculptor working out of New Haven, Connecticut, uh, on the East Coast of the state. Uh, I am here today to talk to you all a little bit about uh, my art science project that seeks to uh, turn a slug into a biodiversity superhero. Um, let me get the screen here for you. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, books, there we go. Okay, so art inspired by nature. Uh, is, is Everybody can see the screen okay, I hope? Yes. Um, art inspired by nature is arguably one of the uh, oldest and uh, most amazing art movements that's out there. Um, it stretches from the cave paintings in Lascaux to uh, all the way back to, uh, or all the way up to this contemporary horse sculpture by uh, Deborah Butterfield. And my work falls directly into that category. Um, I grew up in a family with an underwater filmmaker father. So uh, it's no surprise that when I became a sculptor, my work would uh, turn towards all of the marine life that I saw uh, over the years uh, diving as inspiration for my artwork. Um, I work a lot in stone, uh, fish, shells, um, the occasional echinoderm, uh, squid. These are all subjects that I like to work with. But of all the marine creatures that I became familiar with in my years of diving, my favorite uh, remains the nudibranch. And uh, this is a creature commonly known as a sea slug, not very uh, well recognized outside of the diving world. But these are not your garden variety slugs. Um, the nudibranchs are some of the most extraordinary examples of biodiversity uh, either above or below the water line, as far as I'm concerned. Um, there are some 3,000 species, more or less, uh, more discovered each day, probably more uh, lost every day. They're found in every ocean in the world. Um, I can't go into all their biology. I don't have time, but there's a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, they are true hermaphrodites, and uh, they can choose to be either male or female. And when they mate, both go away pregnant. It's a very uh, efficient system, uh, considering today's sort of gender fluidity. Uh, I think that these guys are cutting edge. Um, they are uh, under threat from ocean acidification, like so many other creatures out there. Uh, and sadly, the fact is that in the next 50 years, in all likelihood, um, the nudibranchs will be gone. Uh, so with that very unfortunate uh, prognosis in mind, I've been developing an art science uh, exhibit about these creatures that uh, tries to bring out some of the details of this incredible example of biodiversity. Uh, these exhibits use two really basic kind of engagement strategies that have really worked wonderfully in connecting people to this example of biodiversity. And the first one that I wanna talk about is a uh, scale. And nudibranchs, uh, most of them are tiny, many no bigger than your fingernail. 
so it's a challenge to bring creatures this small in, into sort of a recognizable form where people can appreciate the details. So I blow them up, which is a, a kind of standard procedure, um, often a way that to uh, take the smaller things in nature and, and um, bring them into sight. Um, these sculptures, the sculpture is about five feet long. And in this case, for example, uh, this is an elid uh, nudibranch. Elid nudibranchs have their gills in the form of serrata that go down their back. Those are all those red tipped forms there. And I'm able to, to bring those to people's attention with this work. Uh, in this case, this is a dorid nudibranch. Dorid nudibranchs have a sort of a feathery gill structure on their back. So the different stones that I work with uh, give me a palette of texture and color that I can use to try to impart something of this amazing variety that can be found in the world of sea slugs. The second engagement strategy that I wanna talk about uh, evolved out of another um, art science exhibit that I collaborated with uh, the Yale Peabody Museum on here, here in New Haven. And this one was about beetles. Uh, we were able to use specimens from the collection uh, uh, focus stacked photograph enlargements of insects and in my sculpture. But what really made this show stand out, I think, and what I think was really the most effective uh, piece of it were these paired images of specific details, specific anatomical features um, on one hand on the actual creature itself and on the other on my particular interpretation of that feature. And what this did was this established a conversation between the artwork and, and the, what inspired it. And that, that sort of symbiosis between the two just was super, super effective in, in getting people to really look at them. And I think uh, giving them a little bit of a biological takeaway from the exhibit, uh, perhaps more so than just uh, text telling them this is a this is an antenna or this is a foot or or that kind of thing. So the artwork serves so well as as a sort of a uh, as a guide and, and a way to to make a connection. I think, um, and and for the sea slugs. Sea slugs, uh, there are two sort of prominent features on them typically, which are their gills and their sensory organs, which are called rhinophores. And uh, this gives you a little idea of the staggering variety in color and shape of sea slug gills. Uh, I'm able to interpret them in stone and uh, impart something of their complexity that way. Uh, in conjunction with images of the actual gill structures themselves, put those two together. Uh, the rhinophores, again, this astonishing um, variety of color to be found over the, the breadth of the 3000 plus species. Um, and I'm uh, able again to, to tinker with them in stone and try to, uh, to impart my own sort of interpretation of them. They, so essentially, and that this exhibit, the Nudibranch exhibit right now is, is uh, at the Maritime Aquarium in Norwalk, Connecticut. It should be there maybe through the summer if any of you have a chance to see it. I hope you do. But again, it, it is this combination of the artwork with, in this case, imagery of sea slugs because there are very few uh, Nudibranchs that can be kept in captivity. Um, they are extremely habitat specific in their diets and they don't do well. So with the sea slugs, we, we had to use photographs, but basically it, it's, it's this, this connection, this back and forth conversation between uh, the artwork and the creature that inspires it. And uh, the, the point of this really for me is that I, I think that art and science, uh, when combined together, can be more effective in engaging an audience than either might be able to on their own. And in the, uh, in the battle to, to bring to people's attention uh, all of the biodiversity that is at risk, you need all the tools at hand. Uh, so scale and this back and forth conversation 
um, you know, nothing new here, but, but this is my own way of, of using them. Uh, we lost uh, E.O. Wilson this year. Uh, he was a hero of mine. And uh, I, I'd like to think that this exhibit is uh, adding something to what is certainly a struggle to remind us of uh, all that we had to lose here in terms of biodiversity. Uh, if anybody wants to see how these sculptures are made, this is a uh, little video clip on Vimeo, if you'd care to see it. Um, you can uh, Google a slug story and my name and uh, it'll come up on Vimeo. All right. Okay. Thank you all. Hi, everybody. Looks like I'm up next. Thank you for those two previous beautiful talks. I actually think I have a stuffed jackalope somewhere in my apartment but I don't have a sea slug statue yet. So uh, <laughs> just trying to figure out how to share my screen. Do you see, do you see the green share screen button at the bottom of your, there we go. I was Googling the slugs. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we go. I'll give it a start. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to the talk. I'm Dr. Nicole Ackermans. I'm a postdoc at Mount Sinai, and I study headbutting in animals like bighorn sheep, and I use them as a model for traumatic brain injury in humans. As you can see, they have some adaptations uh, here on the left, the male bighorn sheep, and all the way to a domestic sheep on the right. They're quite different. Um, and actually, it's kind of a specific niche to be in, so I want to tell the story of how I got there, and it actually has to do with visualization. Um, I, um, I've been obsessed with animals since I was a teenager or since I was a child, but when I was a teenager, I saw this BBC series called Inside Nature's Giants, where Dr. Reidenberg here was climbing inside a whale and yelling out to the camera, look, I'm like Jonah, and just dissecting it on camera in, in front of the whole world. And I thought, if that's a real job, I want to do that job. And uh, a few years later, I heard her voice again on, on this podcast called Ologies, which is one of my favorite podcasts. And she was talking about how her lab was looking into headbutting in sheep, and they wanted to study that further in order to help out with traumatic brain injury in humans. And I just happened to be a PhD student who was studying sheep. So I literally just sent her a cold email. And we ended up drafting an SNF grant together with her and Dr. Hoff of the Hoff Lab, who is my collab here in, in our Zoom picture. And uh, the day after my PhD defense, I found out that I was going to join their lab as a postdoc in New York. So the topic of that grant was why don't rams get concussions? And how do we use bighorn sheep as a concussion prevention model for safer sports? And if you look at them, they hit their heads incredibly hard. I realize they have these gigantic horns that are their namesakes, but I still thought there must be something happening there that looks painful. And the idea was to look at their skull and brain anatomy and be actually surprisingly the first people to look whether they in fact sustain any form of brain trauma at all, and hopefully find out something that could help us prevent brain trauma in humans. Because in the evolutionary process of getting really big brains, us humans unfortunately grew this sort of globular, smooth skull that is very vulnerable to brain trauma. And it is especially vulnerable during these coup counter coup hits when the brain smashes into the inside of the skull. And it's difficult to understand how exactly to prevent these injuries since a lot of the analysis for this is done post-mortem. And because of that, I thought it would be interesting to use another model to look at different types of brain trauma. So we picked an extreme model, which is the bighorn sheep. Um, and they have a specifically shaped brain. It's a lot smaller. It's kind of more oval shaped and it's very vacuum packed inside the skull to the point that the ridges of the skull align with the ridges of the brain. 
And so my question was, does this specific skull shape and horns help them avoid brain injury at all? Um, is the fact that their brain is so vacuum packed helping them not have these coup counter coup injuries? And so that's what we went after. Uh, of course, I started this work in early 2020, so I wasn't able to visit a museum in person, but I looked through a digital museum with the help of uh, some CT scans from a few colleagues uh, that were 3D reconstructed. And it allowed me to get a better look at different skull and brain case shapes. Uh, this goat on the left is a good example of what you can do with these kind of files. Um, this type of sort of 3D old school imaging is, is something really cool that you can put on posters and then hand out 3D glasses to people to get a like nice impression of the shape. And then you can do things like this here on the top is a uh, very rough and quick reconstruction of a brain that I did from the brain case of this musk ox, um, just using these CT scans. We also have here another CT scan of a baby musk ox. Um, and this imaging method is great because it has the advantage of letting us see inside without cutting into the specimen and damaging it. Uh, another type of imaging we did for this project was MRI scans of the brain of three adult musk oxen before we cut into them to see if they had any superficial damage from traumatic brain injury. It turns out they didn't have any, and that's actually quite common in human cases as well. But in this lab, we're not only solely interested in sheep. Uh, there are also a variety of other animals that have specific adaptations to their skull and their brain to protect it from potential injuries. And um, we're very lucky to have in-house illustrators at Mount Sinai. This wonderful figure comparing a bunch of different species was made by Anika Ford, who's also one of the organizers of this event. And she helped us illustrate really how different all of these brain and skull shapes are within the animal kingdom. I mean, we have here some sheep, mice, human. We also put in a woodpecker and whales. And whales are an interesting model for, for brain injury or other brain adaptations because they dive at such high pressures, but they also headbutt. And so in the same publication, we are able to publish the first instance of a whales headbutting or sorry, dolphins, uh, cetaceans, headbutting in the wild. And so that's another form of visualization that we could provide. But in the lab where I work and most other neuroscience labs, a lot of the work takes place on the microscopic level. So here is an image to illustrate that where we have a very thin slice of the human brain. And on the microscopic scale, on the cellular scale, you can apply certain dyes to highlight brain pathology in this case, chronic brain trauma, also called CTE, and see how it changes in different and more cases increasing in severity. And so this is what we tried to apply to our bighorn sheep brains. Um, this is an actual bighorn sheep brain and that's my hand. So it's not very big, it's like this big. And we uh, basically cut it on something like a miniature deli slicer. And once we get these really thin slices, we can stain them in multiple different solutions. This is called immunohistochemistry. And if you want to hear the really interesting details about that, you can ask at the end. Um, uh, and then basically we're able to apply certain dyes to certain proteins that are related to the type of pathology that we're looking for and put them on a microscope slide so that we can look at them under the microscope. And I made this sound pretty quick and easy, but uh, it turns out that not a lot of people use bighorn sheep in the lab on a daily basis. So it actually took about a year of troubleshooting to figure out a way to make this work with bighorn sheep. Um, but finally, after a year, I looked in my microscope for like the hundredth time and got this beautiful neuron that was stained and, and Actually, this was the first time that anyone in the whole world had been able to see any indication that these animals might be suffering from a type of brain trauma. Because until then, we just assumed that it didn't happen. We thought they have horns and so they're fine and forget about it. And so this was a very you know, small, one individual, a few neurons just stained on one time, but it was a really great start to this project to be able to figure out what was going on. And 
as time went on, we found more and more evidence that these animals sustained brain injury. Um, and uh, for example, this image on the right is a fluorescence image where it's kind of the same as the previous with the neurons in red here instead of brown, but we're also able to look at other cells and how they react in this pathology. And the reason I put this picture up here though is mostly because it's really pretty and shiny <laughs> and we're talking about visualization. So I wanted a nice picture. Um, and another way that we could look at this, if you remember these slides from earlier, was that when you look at that umber, when you look at them under the microscope, you can look at every single cell and highlight whether they're pathological or not. And so for every slice, we get something like a map like this that can help us reconstruct throughout this brain section where the pathology is. And fast forward to today, we found evidence that muscoxin and potentially bighorn sheep to a lesser extent show traumatic brain injury patterns that are sort of similar to that of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is a form of chronic mild brain trauma that you often see in professional football players, for example. And this has tons of implications. First of all, using bovids like sheep as a model for traumatic brain injury may be different now that we know this, but also it changes our understanding of these animals' life cycles. Maybe they don't live long enough to suffer from dementia or Alzheimer's like humans do that would potentially result from their brain trauma. Maybe they just, you know, they have their headbutting fight, they reproduce, and that's enough to pass on their genes. So uh, we're currently trying to study all of this, and this work is under review, and so keep an eye out. It hopefully will come out soon. Um, and if you're interested in the press packet, you can contact me. But overall, as usual, every answer brings up something like 10 more questions, and I can't wait to keep answering them. I don't have a Q&A session after this, but you can reach me on Twitter or by email or in this platform. Uh, so thank you for watching, and thank you to the Swiss National Science Foundation for funding my project. And thank you to Sivis for inviting me. <laughs>